We welcome you today to today's webinar on the Arkansas Professional Judgment Rubric and Exit Criteria Guidance. It is being recorded um, in case there are people who were not able to watch today. I appreciate you being here today. Today, I also have with me Alan Lytle, um, who um, is with us as well. We have shared a, can you guys hear me now? Good, I hear a bunch of yeses. Okay, I, I read a bunch of yeses, thank you. Hey, Alan? Yep. Can we hear Alan? I can't hear Alan, hold oh, on. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? I'm glad that you guys can hear each of us. I do not know why I cannot hear Alan. Let me try something else. Okay, Alan, can you try talking one more time? Yes, I can uh, hear. Okay, here we go. Okay, this here work? we go. We will blast off now. I am. I appreciate everyone's patience. Okay, um, let me make streaming recording. Okay, thank you everybody for being here today. We are glad that you are with us. I put a link on when I first logged on to the presentation for you to have a PDF copy. This will be emailed out to my email list as well as distributed on the ADE English Learners page after this webinar. Um, let's get going. Okay, um, the Arkansas ESSA plan was approved in January 2018. And what you are seeing today is a result of much work that was done on behalf of the Arkansas ESSA English Learners and Title III Advocate Group, as well as input from stakeholders across the state. This was approved and since then, we have been um, working together. Alan, can you hear me? Okay, Alan can hear, so I am going to proceed. Please adjust your settings. Okay, let's go on. I have several that said they couldn't hear, so please adjust your own settings. Okay, the ESSA plan can be found on the ADE's website. If you go topics A to Z, it's under ESSA. Um, it's also usually on the front page where it says read Arkansas's plan. You are free to read it at any time and know that all of our work is um, based here. One of the home uh, commissioner's memos that came out recently was commissioner memo LS18083, and it references the entry exit procedures, which is specifically what the professional judgment rubric is a part of. This is an important commissioner's memo for other reasons as well, and summer training is referenced in this, which I'll address at the end. Part of what Alan Lytle and I will be doing this summer is going to 15 different sites to provide training in the new entry exit procedures, which includes information you will be hearing today. The commissioner's memo that came out last week, LS18093, about today's webinar, is on the website as well. And there are attachments to it that actually contain the Arkansas Professional Judgment Rubric Exit Criteria Guidance, as well as the required ADE English Learner um, Exit Form, which we will look at today. Okay, ESSA and Exit Criteria. Part of what ESSA required was that all districts in a state, for us in Arkansas, 
must utilize the same exit criteria and process when determining whether a language minority student qualifies as an English learner or a former English learner. These common entry and exit procedures that are related to language minority students, the basic outline about them are in the ESSA plan on pages 122 to 125. We are expanding that plan to create the entry and exit manual. The Arkansas ESSA English Learners Title III Advocate Group has played a vital role in the creation of the entry and exit procedures, as well as helping to um, refine and come up with what we are releasing with the Commissioner's memo about the Arkansas Professional Judgment Rubric and Exit Criteria Guidance. They used feedback from a survey that we took of ESOL coordinators dating back in November of 2016. So this has been a process that's been in the works for a year and a half to revise the exit criteria that Arkansas has been using. This group also reviewed guidance from the Council of Chief State School Officers. We considered Arkansas data comparing performance on ELPA 21 and ACT Aspire, as well as several other items to help inform our recommendation and final decision to the point where we created the professional judgment rubric. And I apologize that the max on this webinar was at 100. It will be released um, later as a recording. And if need be, I can do another webinar as well. We created the professional judgment rubric and exit criteria guidance. And that is what we're going to mainly be discussing now. The common exit procedures that are listed in the ESSA plan, one is that the timeline of this is that every year, LEAs will annually review every identified English learner's progress in acquiring English. This review will be conducted by a site-based language proficiency and assessment committee. We'll briefly address who has to be on that committee at a minimum further in this webinar. The annual reviews will include a committee analysis of ELPA 21 summative assessment scores and other available student performance data. The exit decisions or placement decisions for the coming year must be made and documented in eSchool no later than September 30th of each school year. These are for kids who are returning to your district. There's a separate timeline for determining placements for students who are initially enrolling in your district. So the criteria for annual review placement. This means these are the students you have had, they've taken the summative assessment and you're reviewing their progress each year to determine what their English learner status is for the coming year. You look at their ELPA 21 scores. If their ELPA 21 summative overall score is emerging or progressing, then you place them as an English learner. And you the LPAC committee then would recommend appropriate English learner services, classroom accommodations, and assessment accommodations, and the parent would be notified of the student's continued identification as an English learner. If at the time of annual review, you have a summative overall score of proficient, and you then would go on and determine whether the student would qualify as a former English learner. The professional judgment rubric, if it also states proficient, then you would recommend exit to former English learner status and you would notify the parent of exit from English learner status and that they would be monitored for four years to ensure continued success. If at the time of annual review, a student has proficient on ELPA 21 and does not have enough evidence to be considered proficient on the professional judgment rubric, then they would continue as an English learner. At this time, Alan is going to share with us how to um, access the ELPA 21 scores.
There we go. Here we go. So let's, Trisha, go ahead and click it. So, okay. Okay. This is also in Live Binder, current Live Binder under updates for um, April 27th. There has been a training module, which is linked here under how. The first link is the PowerPoint with voiceover, and it's approximately 19 minutes long. The second link where it says PowerPoint with no sound is the exact same PowerPoint. It just doesn't have the voiceover, so you could print that out and have the screenshots if you need. Where you would start is with this link that is ar.portal.arast.org. Um, so that's where you'll start with accessing the scores. Now one thing to remember is depending upon the role that you have assigned in TIDE, that will determine what scores you're able to access. So anyone with district level can access scores across the district. Anyone with BTC, like boy, building test coordinator, can only access scores within a building unless you are associated with multiple buildings. Anyone who has TA, test administrator role, then you can only access scores that are associated with you, meaning students that are associated with your name, okay? So if you try to get in and access um, a large group of scores and you can't, the first thing is go to your DTC and see what role you're assigned because maybe that's what's limiting you. Um, I cannot give you access beyond what you have. Um, because it's the DTCs in each district that determine which roles personnel within the district have. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. Now, once you access that portal, then on the left side, and this is a split screen, so on the left side, you'll have six tiles and, with two roles. Second row, second tile, online reporting system, that's where you will click and then it will take you to a screen where you'll log in using your email and whatever your TIED password is. Once you log in with that, then you'll see what is on the right hand side of the screen. It should have your district populated for you and then you have two options, retrieve student results and score reports. Click on retrieve student results and Trish, let's go to the next one and it will take you to the picture on the left. What you'll need to do is um, you will have step one and step two. So under step one, the report type defaults to student data. That will give you an Excel document. If you prefer the individual ISRs, then you need to change that to PDFs of student reports. And it's a dropdown, it only has two options. So student data equals Excel spreadsheet. PDFs of student reports equals individual ISRs. If you look on the right-hand side of the screen, the test automatically defaults to ALPA 21 screener because that's what is currently available. So you will need to change this to ALPA 21 if you want the summative results. Okay, so when you're accessing this, if you find out that you you can only see five or six students, it is probably because you forgot to change the test from screener to ALPA 21 alone. Okay, so let's go to the next screen. All right, so let's say that you want the information in an Excel document and how you access this is completely up to your needs and what your district is going to use these for. So if, you're, if you want to access these scores by an Excel spreadsheet, which many times is the easiest way to do it because you have a single thing to print off, then you can open it up and what you see at the top of the screen is an example of the Excel format download. Because I have access to the entire demo district, when I did this, it downloaded every Excel document 
per grade for the entire demo district. So again, it depends upon the level of access that you have as to what you can download in this Excel um, format. Many of you will only have a few grades associated with the building that you're at or with the students that you um, have tied to your name. So it starts at grade one, goes all the way through grade 12, and then kindergarten is listed last just because the G and the K are alphabetized. Then if you were to open this up, I chose first grade, then the bottom of the screen is what you would see. It is the student um, demographic plus score reports page. And it's a longer um, list, but what I've shown you is the column that you would be most interested in. So under the Excel format download, it's column Q that tells you the proficiency status. Now, not per domain, that is there if you continue on with the columns, but the overall proficiency status for each student is listed in column Q. So to make it easy for yourself, if you're proficient with Excel and you want to do sorts, then you could simply sort out with um, proficient, progressing, emerging, and then not attempted, and it would group them for you. Okay, let's go to the next one. Now, just as a reminder to everyone, this is what the individual student report looks like. So if you would like to do that instead, then you can. But what you need to remember is if you choose the individual student report, there is not a way to batch print. You have to open and print every report individually. So these are the reports that are designed for the district. They have extra information in them, like the standard deviations, which you see is that plus minus, those little gray numbers. You also see the comparison score piece around the middle of the image. Um, this is for the district to use if they choose. All districts in approximately four weeks will receive the parent guardian ISRs has the same type of information, but it looks different. So if you want to wait until you get the parent guardian ISRs and then copy those to put into folders, you can. Um, if you want to print out the district ISRs right now, you can go for it. Um, but to remind everyone where the proficiency status is, that first um, circle, where it says emerging. So for this particular student, this would be the proficiency. When you're using this information with the LPAC, then if you look at the performance domain, which is the second oval, then it will tell you on a scale of one to five what they are. And then to the right of that, it will give the verbiage that is the description for that ability um, for each one of the domains. So this is something that the LPACs can use when you consider continuing placement with students, et cetera, okay? Then the next slide that I have, which is the last slide of my piece, and go ahead, yeah, there we go. Um, this is just to remind everyone of the five performance levels, um, level five all the way down to level one with a single sentence explanation and then the three proficiency determinations and what they actually mean. So what you're looking for when you're considering potential exits is anything that's in green, meaning performance level of five or performance level of four in each one of the domains and then under the proficiency determination, the word proficient. Okay, and then that's all that I have for my portion of the presentation. Okay, thank you, Alan. So the goal for this portion is so you know how to obtain the ALPA 21 scores. And what we're most concerned with are for those students who have a proficient proficiency determination, what to do next to determine whether they can exit. So the next step that you will use is to apply the professional judgment rubric that has been developed by the as the committee that worked on this. In order to exit a student from English learner status, the LPAC must verify that there are three pieces of evidence supporting the decision. 
It was very strongly shared by stakeholders that they did not want our exit decision to be based on one data point, meaning just Delta 21. And triangulation of data is often recommended by researchers to support an educational decision. So once three pieces of supporting evidence are available, including a proficient score in Alpha 21, then the LPAC must exit the student and begin the monitoring process. The goal for this process is to determine when language minority students are ready to be identified as former English learners in a timely and appropriate manner. So in summary, if someone were to ask you, what is the exit criteria now for Arkansas? Basically, there are two pieces. The first one is that your ELPA 21 assessment data reflects a proficiency profile of proficient. While right now we're focusing on the summative results, this is also true with the screener results. If you get a student in who screens with you and they initially score as proficient, then you will apply the professional judgment rubric to see if you will go ahead and place them as a former English learner or whether they will be with you as an English learner. So the professional judgment rubric is the second piece and basically you are needing to provide sufficient evidence um, providing two local pieces of local data that demonstrate success in literacy through English language arts, science, social studies, and or math as comparable to non-English learner or native English speaking peers. So you're basically trying to find two pieces of local data that show this student is performing at a level similar to non-English learners for that grade level. So what is this supporting evidence? Districts must develop a standardized process for further investigation and confirmation of a student's ability to meet grade level performance expectations. You already do a lot of this anyway, as part of the process of just considering data about students and using that data to inform your instruction, how you group students, how you provide interventions, etc. This is just saying that part of what the LPAC has to do is to consider all of the available evidence to see how is this student performing compared to grade level performance. Each piece of evidence that you use to determine whether someone is performing at grade level performance should be something that would align to the English language proficiency standards and to the Arkansas academic standards. A body of evidence should represent local data that is used to define academic growth, success, grade level proficiency, as well as growth to English language proficiency. So overall, there, you should have two pieces of work of data that shows that a student is performing at grade level. So what are some examples of evidence that can be used in addition to ELPA 21? I'm going to preface this by saying this list is not necessarily exhaustive. If you wish to use data that is not listed, you may contact me for approval. And as we build this list out, we will expand it so that all districts may benefit from um, knowing what data may be used when you're trying to locate data that shows a student's performance in grade level work. Scores or performance levels that are comparable to grade level non-English learner peers qualify as acceptable evidence. So when you're looking at, let's say one of the things you did is maybe your school does a writing portfolio on students and you look at students writing portfolios as a whole and you've come up with a scoring system compared to the Arkansas academic standards in literacy and you're looking at their writing compared to grade level performance and you identify these students are writing at grade level these students are close or need help and these students are really not doing well then what you're looking for is are they doing approximately at grade level or above if they are then that is considered comparable evidence 
it is the LPAC's responsibility to consider all available evidence for a given student. In other words, a district in creating their process to review all available evidence may not say something like, well, the only data pieces that our district will consider is ACT Aspire. We cannot limit it to just one or two types of data. It needs to be what is available for that student. You need to look at that data. Once a student has at least two pieces of data indicating performance comparable to grade level non-English learner peers, in addition to scoring proficient on ELPA 21, it is the responsibility of the LPAC to exit the student from English learner status and begin monitoring the student for continued success. So here are some examples of evidence that could be considered. You may consider ACT Aspire. That is a valid data point to consider. So what is it that you're expecting a non-English learner peer to be scoring? Scoring ready or exceeding or at the 50th percentile is a level that is comparable to a non-English learner peer. And that would be true on reading, writing, English. Another piece that you may look at is on ACT Aspire, those three are combined to create an ELA readiness score of either yes or no. Are you college and career ready in ELA? If they are, then that is a piece of evidence that could be considered to document a le level of academic performance comparable to non-English learner peers. The same thing for the ACT Aspire math readiness score. On the actual ACT that students take in 11th grade and may take additionally to that, um, we as a group, the committee that worked on this said for the English reading, math, and science that we would use the cut that the Academic Challenge Scholarship uses. That is available, it may change periodically. It is around a 19 but you can verify that by looking at the Academic Challenge Scholarship Guidelines. Other pieces of data, several districts use the NWEA MAP assessment. So a, a report that you might look at on that is the grade level or the predicted proficiency alignment report. And you'll have training within your district if you use that to determine what is considered at grade level and what is below grade level. Okay, um, another item that you can do is use district formative assessments that you do as a whole. You know, on a district formative assessment though, I caution you not to limit it to, it measured one standard or one discrete skill. Make sure it's more of a summative type work or a body of formative assessments. Okay, a question you may also need make sure you're aware of this, um, can a district use a single score, reading or writing or math, as a single piece of evidence, or do you need to use all of the Aspire scores as a data point? Each of those data points may be considered a single piece. So if they are proficient in English and proficient in math, then you may exit them. They do not have to be proficient in every single data point on the ACT in order to count the ACT or to count the Aspire. Other scores that you could use are the STAR reading scores. You could use reading inventories that you do, writing samples, which I alluded to earlier. You could use Sorry, my screen froze up again, just a moment. In K2, some of the data points you may use would be related to iStation, Renaissance, NWA map, Ames Web, any of the diagnostic assessments you've been using um, as you're determining whether a student um, is part of the universal screening. 
Some have asked in the committee, well, how do you obtain literacy, reading and writing pieces of evidence upon initial screening, in addition to any of the items above, because within the first 30 days of school or two weeks of enrollment, you have to determine whether a student is a former English learner or an English learner for your new students. So you may look at TRIAND, which will have most of those other pieces of data. You may look at former school records. For kindergarten, which is one of the largest groups of initial screenings that a school conducts, you do a lot of kindergarten screening besides ALPA 21. So look at that other body of evidence that you look at. You might be assessing in literacy, you might be assessing writing and reading separately, mathematics, um, general readiness. You might have multiple different assessments you're doing on literacy. As long as you have two results that show they're performing at a level comparable to other kindergartners, if we're discussing kindergarten screening, and they have an ELPA 21 um, profile score of proficient, then you would place them as a former English learner. There's also diagnostic assessments that people use for different purposes. Um, especially as you're trying to determine where students are performing in terms of academic standards. So if any of those results indicate a level comparable to English learner, to English only peers, then if they have two pieces of that type of evidence, as well as an ELPA 21 score, then you would place them as a former English learner and begin the monitoring process. So here is the basic judgment rubric. If you do not have any pieces of data, then you don't have evidence, and so they're not going to be considered proficient. If you only have one piece of data, then they are approaching proficiency, but they're not quite there yet. If you have sufficient evidence, which the committee determined was two pieces of strong data, then they would be considered proficient. If they have three pieces or more, then there's an abundant amount of evidence and they are considered proficient. So examples of strong data, you know, I alluded to a lot of that already, but just to flush it out a little further, an ACT Aspire score in any of the sub areas of ready or exceeding or the 50th percentile or above. And I emphasize that or the 50th percentile or above, especially for um, when you get into ninth, 10th grade, we found as a group that when we looked at the scores, that sometimes ready was high, a high score even for a non-English learner peer. So there are some times when they would be scoring at the 50th percentile and be close. And at those students, if they had a 50th percentile, you would be able to count that as an data that shows they are performing at a level comparable to non-English learner peers. Um, the ICIP or iStation instructional tier one score, that's a score that's on iStation unique to that test. It is 40th percentile or above. Basically they're using that um, piece of data to show this is a group of kids that primarily needs tier one instruction, which is the instruction you would give all students without necessarily being in an intervention group. So that would be one way to say that that student is performing at a level comparable to English only peers. For any of these items, they need to be at or above grade level performance on the items listed. If you do a writing portfolio, it needs to be a portfolio of pieces with consistent ratings as ready or exceeding or proficient or advanced, depending on the verbiage you're using. In other words, if you're trying to find a data point to exit a student and they have written one five paragraph paper that is high enough to be considered ready or proficient, but it's just one time, they had a, a great day, that is not enough. It needs, for writing, it needs to be a little bit more than that. Um, it's not meant to be, they've had one assignment in math that worked well, but if overall in math, you have evidence on some math assessments that they are performing at a level comparable to peers, then you may use that as one of your pieces of evidence. So how do you document this? 
We, as a committee, created the ADE Language Minority Student Exit Monitoring Form. It is provided for you in PDF and Word. They were both attached to the commissioner's memo and they will both be um, on the English Learner website once this webinar is posted. So when do you use this form? The language minority student exit form is completed when you're determining whether a student is a former English learner or not. So there are three different times you would do this. The first and third time are the most common times. The first one is if you are initiating their placement as a former English learner. This would happen either during their annual review, you just got their summative ELPA 21 scores, or it may happen when you initially screen a student and their screener result comes back as proficient. If it's either one of those cases, then you are initiating placement and you would check that line, that that's the reason you're using the form. The second line hopefully will not happen very often, but once in a while it does. You get a student in and you have evidence in Tri-N history that they should have been exited, but it was not documented. On that, you would then use this form to document when they had a language proficiency test score that scored as proficient, and when they had two other pieces of data that would qualify them to exit. This is primarily meant to just document a prior exit that was not documented. And then the third reason is when you're monitoring students. At a minimum, you must use this form to monitor students. You may use additional forms or additional information, but that is a district decision. So your former English learners that have to be monitored for four years, you will use this form from this point forward to document that. Question we are asked, must we use this exact form? Yes, or you must include all elements in an electronic data system, like some people use elevation, that is printable and able to be sent to a transfer district. The idea is that this piece of paper should be able to be found in a student's cumulative folder and forwarded to any receiving district. So what does the form look like? This is, I'm gonna show you in segments of the form. This is the top of the form. We go up, there's the three reasons which we just discussed, but I wanna point out a num number three, if you are monitoring a former English learner because they've been monitored year one, you need to record their exit date on here. That is one way to help communicate that exit date should they transfer to another district. Then it has the other common uh, demographic information. The other piece that's on here is their ELL entry date. Remember their entry date is their first day in any US school, whether it was with you or someone else. Then the first part of the form is where you're documenting that the English language proficiency assessment data is sufficient for exiting. So you use this when initiating placement as a former English learner or documenting a prior exit. You will provide evidence to demonstrate proficiency in English aligned with the Arkansas English language proficiency standards. So on this, you would check that they have an ELPA 21 screener proficiency profile. You put what it is and the date they have that test. Or you would check that they have an ELPA 21 summative proficiency profile, you list what it is, and put the date they took that. Or if you're documenting a prior exit, you could use a prior state approved ELP assessment score and the dates and list that. Please note, this is not available or required or even possible for monitoring a former English learner. Once they are a former English learner, they no longer participate in ELPA 21. The next piece on the form is where you document supporting evidence or professional judgment. At least two pieces of evidence providing confirmation of a student's ability to meet grade level performance expectations in literacy in English language arts, science, social studies, and or math. 
And this is where you would list the two measures that the LPAC found that demonstrated grade level performance. You would name the measure, what result they had, and the date that that measure took place. You have to provide two. If you cannot provide two, you may not place the student as a former English learner. So if I say that an ALPA 21 score proficient, and you can only put one, then you may not, they have to continue as an English learner. Or you have an ALPA 21 profile score proficient, but no evidence exists to confirm the student's academic literacy, then you would check no evidence exists and they would be placed as an English learner which is documented in the next section of the form. The recommended status, this is where the LPAC would choose whether the student is recommended for English learner or former English learner status. If you choose former English learner status, you must also indicate which year of monitoring the student is beginning or if monitoring is completed. So on this form, if they have the two pieces of Additional data, you would check former English learner, you write their exit date, which is the date that you're completing this form for the first, if it's, you're exiting them. Um, you would put that exit date here and you would mark them as monitored year one. Now, we're at the end of a year, you've got some kids who are monitored year one right now. To monitor them for next year, you're looking for two pieces of data that show they're performing at a level comparable to English only peers. You would indicate on this section, the two measures that show they're still performing at a level comparable to English only peers. And then you would check former English learner and now mark monitored year two, if it's a year since they exited more than a year. That is a ca calendar year. So August of 16 to August of 17, that is M1. From August of 17 through August of 18 would be M2. It is done by a calendar year. Now when you get finished monitoring a student and monitored year four, you would then check that monitoring is completed. At that point though, you leave their exit date. Once they're exited, unless you return them to English learner status, they maintain that exit date until graduation. Now, if you are reviewing the data and they don't have evidence to confirm their academic literacy at a level comparable to never English learner peers, then you would check the English learner box. And in eSchool, you would make sure that the value box is still checked. The items in parentheses are clues to you as to what has to be checked in eSchool or completed. Then the LPAC must sign this, and all three of these signatures are required. You may have additional LPAC members, but you are not required to. These are the three positions that must be represented on an LPAC. An administrator, an ESOL designee, that can be an ESOL teacher, an ESOL coordinator, um, the person responsible for delivering ESOL services for that child. And then a mainstream teacher or counselor, someone who is familiar with that child's performance. So once all the information's reviewed, the committee signs off on it, and then you notify parents of the determination that you made, whether they're an English learner or a former English learner, and indicate the date you did so. This particular notification, you don't have to get a signature back on this. You just have to notify and document that you notified. Notice that the parent does, is not required to be a member of the LPAC. You may have them participate if you so choose, but it is not required by the state. Parent notification then occurs. Sample forms and what criteria should be on these notifications will be included in the entry exit manual and being released in late May. You may utilize the current parent notification letters you have until you receive new letters or criteria. And I'm just letting you know that basically for this particular notification, the requirements have not really changed overall. 
Training on the entire entry exit manual will occur during the summer, during the ADE English Learner updates that Dr. Lytle and I will be going around the state conducting. We will also provide a series of webinar trainings on the entry exit manual once it is complete as well. So you should have multiple ways to access the information. Okay, a question was asked, I'll go ahead and answer it here. Um, can you be an administrator and the ESOL coordinator on the LPAC? Um, you really need to have three people on there. You might need to put an additional teacher on there as long as it's done by three people who know the student and then just indicate, because I do know, especially in small districts, sometimes the building administrator is the ESOL coordinator. So just make sure you have two people who can, uh, a total of three people who have worked with that student who can vouch for it and represent those three types of positions. Okay. Um, on iStation, will it be separate pieces of evidence like with ACT Aspire? For instance, can tier one in literacy and tier one in math be two pieces of evidence? Yes, it can be separate. Tier one, tier one in literacy could be one piece and tier one in math could be a second. Do you need to send notifications for M2 to M4? Yes, you need to notify that you're continuing to monitor. Do nine week grades count as evidence? Um, as a general rule, we said we were not considering grades at this time. If you had a body of work that was scored to standards, then you potentially could consider that. Part of it depends on how you determine the nine week grades. So you may want to email me about how you determine nine week grades, but as a general rule, we're not saying um, grades. So every year of monitoring must have two additional pieces of data. That is correct. That is so that we are unified in how we are monitoring whether a student continues as a former English learner or needs to be an English learner. If they can maintain two pieces of data that show that they are performing at a level comparable to non-EL peers, then they may continue as a former English learner. Can the three people in the LPAC be the mainstream teacher, counselor, and ESOL designee? You must have a building administrator represented so that they are aware of, it's just documenting that they are aware of the um, levels of English learners in the building. It is not just up to the teachers and the ESOL designee. Okay, going to go on. Those are all good questions. So you do need to monitor students for four years, former English learners. They continue to receive appropriate academic supports as needed, just like you might provide to any other student. Upon completion of four consecutive years of monitoring, the students are eligible to be released from monitoring if they continue to demonstrate English language proficiency and academic growth success grade level proficiency in reading writing and other content areas that's why you need two pieces of evidence that show they are still performing at a level comparable to grade level if at any time a district or school determines that students no longer are demonstrating language and grade level proficiency then you transition them back to an english language development program as an english learner that's the reason for monitoring So how do you document EL students who exit services? You use that ADE, Language Minority Student Exit Monitoring Form. You enter the English learner exit date in the EL entry exit at the end date. This is the date the student met state criteria for fluent English proficient status and was exited from the English learner program and no longer eligible to receive services. And on this, you enter a month, day, and year. Notice this is not when they leave your district. This is only when they meet state criteria. So there should only ever be one line in the entry and exit line. You should have an entry date and an exit date if they have met criteria for exiting. 
you would uncheck the value box to the right of the English learner entry date. And then you would mark M1 as well in the monitoring field. Then each year when you monitor, you make sure the exit date stays the same. Make sure that value box was not checked, does not, is not checked if they're a former English learner. And then you go to M2, the next year to M3, the next year to M4. This is not an automatic rollover in eSchool. This is a process that you need to document and then go in and enter and change from M1 to M2 to M3 to M4. So let me see what questions we have. We just have a couple more minutes and I have some brief announcements at the end. Did not mean to go backwards. Um, can teacher, let's see. Can teacher input be used for monitoring? We used forms that teachers complete. We are not using that now. It must be a similar measure. We are going to monitor how well this exiting goes using assessment data or other performance data that you gather on students that you otherwise gather. If we are unable to provide exits based on the available data that's already out there, then we may consider creating a teacher form that teachers could complete, but that would require validating the form across state and provide training across the state on the same um, teacher rubric. Must all exits be based on the same measure or are we allowed to pull from a collection of designated assessments and evidences? You, are you must look at everything that's available and if you can find two pieces for a student, that is fine. Jose's two pieces may look different, may not be the same two pieces as San Juan's, which may be different than Maria's. As long as they have two pieces, from evidence that you look at to determine whether students are at grade level, then they have that in Alpha 21, you must exit them. So if a student scores proficient on Alpha 21, but does not have sufficient evidence to support exiting, do they need to take Alpha 21 again the following year? Yes. As long as they are an English learner, they keep taking Alpha 21. And Alan had a great response here. Basically, any evidence should be standardized. That's why we don't use nine week grades. Teacher input probably isn't standardized against a rubric, so I would need to sign off on it first. If you want to show me what it is you're considering, we can consider how standardized that is. Um, Alan's answered a lot of those. Do annual reviews need to take place at the same time every year? Um, you need to have everyone's placements reviewed and placements updated by September 30th in eSchool so that when we pull your numbers for cycle two, it is reflecting where students are for the entire school year. Your exited students are exited, your served students are identified as English learners. I encourage you to make this a workable system. Some people review your existing students in the spring some do it in the summer, some do it in August. But remember, you still must be able to exit or to um, initially assess and place your incoming students in the fall. So create a schedule that works for you. Um, so Shamini, you can do it in May or at the beginning of the school year. Just make sure at the beginning of the school year you have the data available from the prior year if needed and that you have time to do that as well as your new students. Um, is it possible to, we have a lot of good questions still here, I'm seeing. Yeah, the information in eSchool does not roll over. One thing we are looking at creating is a transfer form that would be required when a student goes from district to district as part of the entry exit manual. Must the supporting evidence be from the current year? The supporting evidence must be the most recently available evidence in that particular piece. So for instance, your seniors. Some people were asking me earlier this week, can we exit seniors? You may if they have 
let's say they had an ACT score in 11th grade that qualified, but they needed that Alpha 21 proficient, then you could, would be able to exit them. So it needs to be within the last year and the most recently available score. Can Dibbles be used as evidence? Dibbles as a whole could be. Will these questions answers be included? Yes. Um, I mentioned something I think for 12th grade, if you have writing portfolios that could possibly be considered for 12th grade. Okay, if you exit a student now, they become in M1. Would we then move them to M2 this time next year? Yes, a calendar year later. Okay, so I'm going to go on with our final announcements and we will summarize these questions and we will be compiling an FAQ about all of this um, as we go. Hey, there is some training this summer on the ADE English Learner Updates. You can go to the Commissioner's Memo link there. You may attend any site. You do not have to attend the one in your co-op. Central Arkansas, if it doesn't have a co-op, there's training at Maumel High School on June 7th. For Great Rivers and Crowley's Ridge, there is a combined training at Eastern Arkansas Community College. You may attend any site. Okay. Um, the ADE data conference July 19th and 20th is when I will do a presentation about all things eSchool data entry related, related to your English learners. There'll be three different sessions that repeat the same information and this one will also be recorded as a webinar and posted on the ADE English learners page. There are ESOL institutes where teachers can obtain a professional development certificate in teaching English learners and or graduate credit of 12 hours that once they also pass the ESOL praxis would add an ESOL an ESL endorsement to their license. There are still a few openings at some of the sites. There are also some other professional development opportunities being led by our two English learner specialists and that's Lisa Coates and Jana Catlett and you can click the link here for registration information. You can see the different titles of sessions being offered and at which co-ops those sessions are being offered. We do have a full staff trying to serve you the best we can. So try to stay calm as we all learn and move ahead. Um, we are here to help you. If you're needing help with data entry items, Teresa Cotton, the EL admin assistant can help with that. Okay. Um, I appreciate all of your time. I'm going to stop the recording, but we'll leave the Q&A open if you want to submit some questions that we can consider answering for you in a final document that we mail out. So thank you very much, and I hope you each have a great day, and thank you so much for teaching, and I hope that this week that there are people in your lives making you feel extra special for being teachers during this Teacher Appreciation Week.